Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Kevin Cosby in Louisville, Kentucky, St. Stephen Baptist Church, with another powerful point to ponder as we spend meaningful moments with the master. Thank you for joining us today as we continue our theme, Surviving Friendly Fire. Friendly fire is the fire that we experience, the hurts and pains we experience from friends, from allies, from family members, from clergy, from church members, people we trusted and believed in, and they hurt us. Friendly fire. The hurts that come from someone we trusted. And we've been looking at the friendly fire of some of the people in the Bible. We know that, that Paul had friendly fire. Uh, we looked at Alexander the coppersmith yesterday, and we know Jesus had it because of Judas. We know David had it because he was betrayed by a man named Ahithophel. Friendly fire. You know, it's interesting that the word for crisis in Chinese are the the figures for tri crisis in the Chinese language, crisis is the same figures for opportunity. And they do that intentionally. Think about it. The same characters in the Chinese language for crisis is the same characters in the Chinese language for opportunity. And they do it that way because for them, from the Chinese perspective, when you say crisis, they'll say, well, let me look at that again. That's opportunity. You see, a, a lot of people see difficulties in their opportunities, and some people see opportunities in their difficulties. One person can look at a situation and say, crisis. Another person can look at the same situation and say, no, opportunity. I once heard about uh, a, 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 a shoe salesman from a shoe company who was sent by the company to a country where there were a lot of poor people. And this person who was a salesman went to this country and when he saw all the poor people who didn't have shoes, he said to his company, bring me back home. This is useless. These people don't wear shoes. Why you have me here? They don't even wear shoes. Well, he sent another salesman. The salesman sees all these barefooted people and says to the company, hey, please send all the shoes you can. These people don't wear shoes. They, two salesmen saw the same thing, but they responded differently. They were looking at the same thing. One says they don't wear shoes. I give up. One says they don't wear shoes. That means I can convince them to wear shoes. It's all how you look at something. And here in the book of Philippians, I want to look at something. In the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 12, Paul is looking at what might be a crisis as an opportunity. He says, I want you to know, my dear friends and my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me has helped to spread the gospel. Now, what has happened to Paul? Betrayal, Alexander the coppersmith, um, he's incarcerated. A lot of things that bad has happened to Paul, but he's looking at the character and say, wait a minute, this is not crisis. This has become an opportunity. Now, how has it become an opportunity? It's helped to spread the gospel, he says in verse 12. Verse 13, he explains why. For everyone here, including the whole palace guards, those are the guards who are guarding him, know that I am in chains because of Christ. So the guards who are guarding Paul are now becoming Christians. In fact, at the very end of the book, he says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 21, he says, give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you their greetings. And all the rest of God's people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. Caesar's household are those who work for Caesar. And he says, these are the people of God. And they became the people of God because while Paul was in jail, he ministered to them. And these Roman soldiers were guarding him, got converted and became Christians. And Paul never would have had that opportunity had not Paul been in jail. So what looked like a crisis actually became an opportunity. Please send me more shoes. These people do not wear shoes. But go back to Philippians chapter one and let's pick up on verse 13. Notice what it says. For everyone here, including the whole palace guards, know that I'm in chain because of Christ. Verse 14, and because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. In other words, because they've seen Paul's 
uh, willingness to speak boldly for Christ, even though it meant his imprisonment, it has put confidence in a very timid clergy. And now they're speaking up also. But then he says something about these preachers who are bold to preach because Paul's in jail, how he's infused confidence in them. But he, he gives this little caveat. He says, it is true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. Verse 16, they preach because they, they love me for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those who do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ, they preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely intending to make my chains more painful. In other words, Paul is saying, well, there are some good ministers out here preaching for, for pure motives. There are some charlatans who are just in it because it's, it's, it's a game. It's a, it's a path to popularity. Now, they're preaching, but they're preaching from pure motives and they're preaching from a, from a, from a motivation of competition against Paul and taking advantage of the fact that Paul is still in prison. This is what you call friendly fire. Preaching, these are preachers trying to hurt Paul. But you know what? This is what Paul says. He says in verse 17, the latter verse, he says, the latter sentence says, they preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely intended to make my chains more painful to me. Listen to Paul's response. But that doesn't matter. If you got your Bible out, that's the key to everything. Don't let non-essential things get to you. A lot of the things we spend a lot of emotion on does not matter. It's not important. People try to hurt you if they can't. Look, it's not important who likes you. It's not important if their motives are not right. Don't get caught up in the non-essentials. Don't lose your joy over the non-essentials through the friendly fire of competitors. Because guess what Paul says? He says, whether the motives are false or genuine, who cares? The message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice. That was, I have joy and I will continue to rejoice. Do not listen to me. Let Listen, don't let non-essentials cause you to lose your joy. Let me give you an acrostic for joy, or excuse me, an acronym for joy, J-O-Y. The J stands for Jesus. The Y, which is the last letter in joy, stands for you. J for Jesus, Y for you. And the middle letter is not really a letter. Let's make it a digit. Let's make it zero. So this is what joy is. Jesus, zero, Y, you. So joy is simply this. Don't let zero or anything come between Jesus and you. Try to see that in every crisis, there's opportunity. Tell the, the sales manager, send me more shoes. I see an opportunity in the crisis. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, bless your people today. Help us to focus on what really matters. And if we're hurting, ask, help us to ask ourselves, does this really matter? Does it really matter? And, and get the glory and get the victory, I pray, Jesus, in regardless of what happens in life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me again with another powerful point to ponder. Which if you don't have a church, I'd like to invite you to become a part of St. Stephen Church. Email us, or you might just need someone to talk to. Email us, newstart at ssclife.org. Thank you so much for joining me, joining me. I hope you have a blessed day today. And don't forget during COVID-19 to stay safe, stay sane.
remember God is in control. Take care, my friend.